All right, we're almost ready to get started. Um, as we're waiting for the last few uh, attendees to join in, uh, again, welcome to Going Global, expanding your web presence for international success. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and we will distribute the recording uh, uh, <clears throat> likely tomorrow morning at some point. Uh, if you've registered, you will indeed get uh, the recording. And also I would encourage you to ask questions. Um, the webinar uh, functionality does have a chat box, so feel free to go ahead and ask any questions you like, and we will try to address those, address those as the uh, presentation goes on. So let's uh, please make this conversational. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's take a look at the materials that we're going to cover today. So here is our agenda. We'll go over strategy. Again, some of the things that you should be thinking about before launching into a translation project for your website. Uh, we'll cover domain names uh, and the choices you should make there, routing and language selection, as well as speed and hosting to make sure uh, that your website is always at optimal uh, availability for your clients, no matter where they are in the world. Uh, optimization of international SEO, as well as multilingual search, how to target your customers, how to build a translation process around your website, and also choosing the right CMS. So let's go ahead and get started. Just a quick introduction. My name is Peter Argandizo. I'm the president at Argo Translation. Um, the company was founded over 25 years ago. I was a medical device uh, project manager for, for translation and was frustrated with the uh, choices out there for uh, translation services. So we've been growing ever since. Um, very pleased to be starting uh, our 25th year of business. And I'm also joined by Rob Sanders, who's the Senior Enterprise Product Manager at American Eagle. Rob, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thanks, Peter. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, you know, thanks for logging on this morning and uh, participating. So my name is Rob Sanders. I've uh, been with AmericanEagle.com going on towards 17 years next month. Uh, my role is uh, purely strategic as I guide a lot of companies through the, the, the vast discovery process of, of new and existing web-based applications. But I also work with them on what their digital goals for their businesses should be, and ultimately I then execute on those goals for success. So I primarily now uh, work with a lot of fortune companies for the past few years. And one thing I, I find satisfying is making my clients uh, successful you know, in this digital world we have, and which is very challenging, but I like to also have fun um, teaching and sharing my experiences. Back to you, Peter. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, so just a little bit, we'll talk a little bit about our company so you understand um, where we're coming from. Uh, a little bit about Argo Translation. As I mentioned, we were incorporated in 1995. We essentially serve the translation needs of corporations all over the world. Um, we do one of two things. We either help clients to better engage with their employees, no matter where they are in the world. So that would be training materials, digital materials, HR related, legal, or we help them to generate more revenue. So we help them to open up new markets so they can generate new revenue. We do have a professional team of translators, editors, interpreters, and page production um, folks on our staff. We have very strict process control and management systems which make up our, um, our ISO programs. We are ISO 9001, 13485, and 17100 registered. And we are a leader in deploying memory management uh, for our clients for their benefit. In other words, we, we store everything that we translate for our clients so that then as they're reusing content, we're providing discounts. So we're very proud that we were one of the first in the industry to return those savings back to our clients. Rob, if you could tell us a little bit about American Eagle. So I'm, I'm happy to see a lot of uh, our customers actually on this webinar. So for those who don't know American Eagle, uh, we are a, a full service uh, web development company uh, we do have 11 locations nationwide, and we are currently expanding also into the European market as we're doing more and more work with uh, international businesses. So we are family owned, we're private. Uh, we did start in 1978, mostly on the Apple IIe software side. And then we also, then we converted actually to full-time web development services in 1994, 
uh, when the internet was mostly in its infancy as far as websites were concerned. Uh, we do keep growing due to the success of our customers and their need for high quality work and attention. As you see, we're currently cresting over 450 employees. And to date, we have successfully launched over 12,000 projects. And these can be web development projects, stra strategies, uh, SEO projects. Um, and we just have a huge diverse uh, population of industries that we've done work for. Back to you, Peter. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. So <laughs> just some things to think about for strategy. So. Um, before launching into uh, creating a new website or creating a new international presence on the web, you may want to think a little bit about how you're going to do that. So there's three schools of thought. There's, there's thinking of localization. So do you want to build something that's really specific to a country or a region? In other words, you may actually create a completely different website. So something very different than um, say for most of the corporations that are probably on with us today, they're here in the States. So it, it could look very different from the website that you host here in the States. Um, Rob, anything that you can add a little bit on strategy for when clients are doing that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when doing business, especially in a localized area of the world, um, you know, your imagery does matter as well. So there, there, people want to see the way that they speak, the way they do business in a, a localized fashion. So even using, um, you know, not only their, their dialect within that region, but also imagery um, is also very, has a huge impact uh, to that area that you're trying to localize your business to. This is also effective very much in e-commerce, but also in service offerings. That's a great point, Rob, and I think it sort of starts up the conversation as, as you're thinking about taking your website um, international, you should think about some of the things that you would include or exclude. What are some of the things that you would do differently in your target countries? For example, if you talk about your blog section or your news section, and it's very specific to your market here in the U.S., you may want to think about creating content that's more international so that you're, you're you're starting to weave in a story that you are truly a company that is doing business in all those locales. Um, the other school of thought, and probably the more common one, is an idea of globalization. So this is taking your current site, in other words, the same design, the content, the images, and taking that to everyone in the world. Now, you still may make some small tweaks, and we are gonna get into selection of content management systems a little later in the presentation, but this is where this becomes key. You know, what elements are you going to have that are the same across all of your website properties? So in, all the, in other words, all the countries that you're doing business in. Um, Rob, anything to add on globalization? When I think of globalization, you know, I really think about giving the company a global presence. You know, if they truly want to be and have a global presence, and this is usually done, and I'll say this is a one-to-one -one content translation. Um, it, using almost the exact context of their content. So you are doing a pure translation of, say, your homepage in uh, the United States region, but also doing the same thing in China as a one-to-one -one translation. It's not being localized. You're establishing yourself as a globalized corporation. So, and this also comes into a sense of, okay, well, if I'm being a global company and I'm going globalization, you know, is the company actually United States based or is it internationally based? So this could also be a use case of using British English for your primary global website versus a United States English for your main primary global website. And I think that's all the, a lot of times a misconception, you know, if it's a US based company that is global, are they truly global if it's not in proper, proper uh, British English versus the United States English? So it's definitely a, a company decision when it comes to that. That's a really, really good point, Rob. We just recently launched a website that actually had three versions of English on it um, to show you how far that client was going in terms of providing um, um, sort of content that their, their clients would be comfortable with no matter where they are. And that also leads to then internationalization. So um, the way that I think of internationalization, internationalization as being different from localization and globalization is it might be a situation where 
you're sort of targeting your business practices. In other words, are you going to do a whole series of, you know, microsites or perhaps landing pages that are incredibly specific uh, to a region or, or a country? You may even decide to do certain products. So in other words, you know, if, you're, if you're offering products on your site, you might say, well, this product really only does well in China. So you're going to build a website specifically around that product. And again, that may not exist uh, when you're looking at your strategy here in the States. Uh, anything else to add on that, Rob? Yeah, exactly. You kind of took the words out of my mouth there with the, you know, the services and actual physical products. You know, there are, there are also, I know I have a customer that's actually on this presentation right now that they actually offer a product here in the United States and it is the exact same product uh, in a different country, but under a different name. Um, so it's marketed differently in a different name and a different country. So internationalization is something huge, but um, you know, the, the actual specifications of it are exactly the same, but translated to be in that international market uh, where th they sell that product only. That's actually a really good point. And there are, of course, we could really get into the weeds on a lot of different issues. And this would be a six hour uh, webinar, which um, would really try our, our customers patience. But <laughs> that is a good point because around product names, especially that's something that we always talk about sort of in the kickoff stages of a, a project with our clients is just because something's trademarked here, you have to understand, well, what are we going to do with that trademark in other countries? Are we going to seek, seek a trademark for those names? How are we going to treat that? So that's great that your, your customer is obviously thinking about those things. Um, one other point to think about is, great, we're throwing a party and we're inviting people from all over the world to participate in this website. How are we going to handle it when those people start to interact with us? And all too often, uh, we find that clients aren't thinking about that. So what does that mean? If someone fills out a form, if someone engages with you, if you have a chat box or a, ch a chat window on your site, what if someone engages in a foreign language? How will you handle that? So it's really good from a strategy perspective to think about what are we gonna do with our leads when they come in in a foreign language? How are we gonna handle this very quickly so we can distribute the leads to others? So, um, you know, that's, that's really, really important. So yes. um, yep. anything to add on that, Rob, before we- Yeah, I've, I've found, you know, I've worked with a lot of great companies that actually have uh, regionalized offices and when it comes to let's say feedback mechanisms and interacting with conversions um, we, we route those a specific way as well not only is uh, corporate informed of that feedback but it's also the responsibility of that foreign office or that international office to handle the uh, the conversion or feedback for that specific uh, customer of theirs Great, thank you, Rob. Yeah, that's definitely important. And I think that's something that, um, you know, our, our, our customers should think about is that, you know, please engage your, your, the firm you're using for web development and for translation to help you with those discussions because they can assist. In other words, if you need integration to a CRM or you need, um, you know, how can we route these responses? Those are all things that can be handled in development as well then in translation. So Rob, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, why don't you jump into this discussion on domain names and considerations people should think about for their website? Sure, sure. Education on domain names, uh, especially in, in foreign countries, is it's a really tough discussion to have, and it's it's one where um, you know when you get into really localization, how how are those websites being served in those countries? So from what we just talked about a few minutes ago with the localization you know, domain name extensions do matter in a lot of international countries. Um, and I say this because certain internet, internet service providers, search engines, even your browser that you're using, like Chrome, anything will actually detect your, the locale, the language where you're coming from, the country, and serve up localized results for you uh, before giving you an international result. So let's say you're operating and say providing services in a specific country, you know, it's best served to host your website on a localized domain extension. That way any search engines things are, will actually provide those results to you in that localized fashion. We've also found that uh, normal domestic domains to us, like the .coms, the .nets, um, in areas like Korea and China, they can also be blocked or throttled 
by organizations and internet service providers within those countries, you know, making it very difficult to do business if those websites are not localized. Um, E-commerce business is also a big one. So we also encourage those uh, domains, if you're doing e-commerce business, to be on a localized domain in those international regions. Um, when you get into, um, uh, we have a domain squatting and defensive registration. It's, it's never, um, we're never going to tell you not to get, uh, not to go ahead and purchase a, uh, a localized domain in a certain country. Um, they do this because there are squatters out there that will look at all large companies and new businesses coming out, um, especially if they watch Shark Tank. Um, they grab those domains up and they'll squat and they'll just end up costing you more money and actually will uh, cause a lot of havoc, uh, legalized uh, havoc on you when trying to get into an international market. Uh, we also suggest uh, getting similar domains. Um, you know, we all have trouble spelling things at times and we may make mistakes spelling things, but even using different variations of your domain uh, just to make sure you can get to your, your corporate website. Peter, any uh, other insight on the uh, translation side? Um, from a translation side, just know that, um, you know, that's something that is good to work out with um, your development team uh, before you get started because it can change a little bit of the strategy, especially depending on the CMS you choose. So I, I would say just kind of work this out before you sort of launch uh, as it can change things in the structure of the site. So it's, it's pretty important. Um, if we work over to the next slide, uh, Rob, why don't you take us through a little bit about um, routing and language selection. So in other words, what's going to happen when the visitor comes to the site and they want to try to get to their version um, of the translation? Yep. And I kind of alluded this to in a few minutes ago when uh, selecting domain names and serving certain countries that, you know, service providers, search engines, browsers um, will direct you. So, it, it's, it's advisable when doing a development project that you keep this in mind on how is your user going to get to the localized version that you want them to get to of your website uh, or your web application. So is this an automated item um, to, to display that language? And I always suggest the best, uh, my, my favorite mechanism, I guess most proven, is actually using the browser language detection, which is the third bullet here. Uh, I found that a lot of people do speak English, or they not do speak, they can read English, not speak English. But if you can actually provide your website to them and match up your um, a locale of your web application to the user, that's going to create their make their experience much better. But also giving them a clear way of changing their language, as we see um, some examples here. Um, there are clear ways to actually provide a different language for them to view localized or international content. Now, what we don't suggest is this top uh, reasoning here as far as using a flag. Um, certain CMSs actually automatically put this flag in for you, but to me, it's very misleading. And I say this, uh, the use of flags for language selection is not advised, in my opinion. Um, and even though you may be displaying Spanish, just remember, Spanish is spoken in many other countries than probably the flag that they're going to be displaying for you. So the same goes for French, even though you have to keep in mind that there is that there are specific French dialects for Canada and France, you know, using that proper dialect will also allow you to connect and not offend certain populations. I would agree 100%, Rob. I think that uh, that is really important, uh, especially with those languages. You know, Portuguese is another one, you know, spoken in Portugal as well as in Brazil. So I think identifying, identifying the flag really only alienates a certain part of, the, uh, uh, of your audience. So uh, the suggestion would be to just list the name of the language. That would uh, be the best approach. Yeah. Um, so what, um, go ahead, Rob, I'm sorry. I, and I know uh, Peter and I both have, uh, we have to keep in mind our customers' budgets um, and you know, choosing something that does serve many areas. You don't have to do everything, um, but if it does cover a broad spectrum, if, if, if Espanol covers a broad spectrum of your audience and your demographic, um, we do encourage you to you know, 
keep with a strong language base and then expand based on where you see your demographics coming through analytics. If you're doing more business in certain countries, then expand upon different dialects of that language. Great, thank you. Uh, just a quick reminder, um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, use the chat box and uh, post a question and we'll be happy to address it during the webinar. We'll have a little time at the end, but no need to reserve, uh, uh, if, if, especially if it's, um, if it's germane to the slide we're looking at. So please feel free to jump in. Uh, let's go ahead and move towards speed and hosting. And this is something that Rob, you, you started to touch on a little bit about some of the considerations in the countries and how they may throttle your content or not allow certain downloads. I know uh, we use a, a web delivery system for files and I know that there are certain times when our clients in China can't access those files. Tell us a little bit about what you can do when you're developing a site to provide consistent speed no matter where the customers are and how, how, what sort of recommendations you make to clients. Sure. Well, I mean, there's so many different options out there when it comes to hosting uh, websites these days. And you know, we're all concerned with you know, the speed uh, that sites load in our uptime with our websites. So when having a website, especially in a translated sense with multiple versions and translations um, that are spread across the world, you know, we will almost always recommend a content delivery network or otherwise known as uh, the acronym of CDN. Uh, you know, these CDNs have greatly improved over the past few years. Uh, we're now serving remote areas of the world that, uh, that were never, you know, they were throttled before, not even served through a CDN, just to provide a be better digital experience and a fast experience for those in the web. You know, CDNs, they offer localized services you know, to spread your site across the world and be loaded from a localized server, you know, within that country. So there's thousands of these uh, web servers across the world kind of replicating and hosting your content and then being able to serve it up from that country, um, meaning that you will not get throttled or you won't get uh, restricted from accessing it. Um, and just remember, if you say you only host, let's say on a United States based web server, and you're trying to run an international business without a CDN, I, you know, there will for sure probably be hiccups in serving your hit content to many of the, to so many of those international countries without the proper hosting setups. Um, you know, one thing we do here at AmericanEagle.com, we actually really pride ourselves on what we recommend uh, for hosting services. We want to know who you're serving, where you're serving, and we want to also just help you understand and educate you on all of the intricacies and conditions around the world that you're trying to reach. Um, okay, a question just came in. Um, someone asks, will China block CDNs? If that CDN is not approved or has servers within that country. This is something that's ongoing. Uh, we're seeing more and more uh, CDNs actually moving in to that country like Akamai. Um, you know, even, um, but it's, it's one of those things that if, if China is one of those countries you're trying to reach to do business in, then we need to do our proper homework and, and choose the correct CDN for you. Great. Well, thank you for that question, Rob. Thanks for addressing it. I guess I have one. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, after doing this for, for many years, we have clients of different levels of sophistication, Rob, you know, some that have their own in-house web development teams and some that are smaller teams and it's completely outsourced. Um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, what if a client comes to you and says, you know, we don't really have the wherewithal, we don't really understand the hosting and the routing and how to get this going, but we have this growing e-commerce business and we have customers all over the world. Is there a way that, that you guys can help? Is that something that like a developer, like an American Eagle can say, yeah, we can help you put that all together and get the routing set or, or is that, how, do, how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. We do, we do hosting services for many companies for, for sites we didn't even build. So we are a PCI one uh, level, level one compliant uh, hosting provider. So we, uh, we actually obtained that certification when we actually hosted the, uh, the whitehouse.gov many years ago um, and just maintained that, uh, that clearance and that, that heightened security uh, for our clients. 
So we, we also host um, weathertech.com, which actually runs Super Bowl commercials. So the traffic that comes in even around the world from the Super Bowl being aired across the world and, and transactions, you know, the thousands of transactions they do within minutes um, is something that, that we definitely take pride in preparing for and setting up our clients for success and no downtime. But absolutely, we will, we will uh, we'd be happy to talk with you about uh, any hosting needs that you have. Great. Yeah, thank you. So that seems like you guys could cover pretty much from A to Z. So that's wonderful. Because, yeah, we, we definitely have seen clients that have um, that need where they don't have the internal resources uh, to cover that sort of thing. So thank you for offering that. So a um, little bit about international SEO. Uh, I will go ahead and jump in on this one to get the conversation started. Um, in our, from our perspective, what we tell our clients is to really know their audience. A lot of the considerations that you put into SEO for your source site, again, let's assume that we're, we're speaking about an English site, will go into, you know, what you're doing across the globe. I mean, after all, if you're, if you're targeting marketing managers or you're targeting engineering managers, some of the same, um, some of the same keywords are going to be uh, important regardless of where you are. Now, how you translate that is very important and how you translate the content on your site is very important. We've touched on it a little bit. Um, you know, there are some, uh, there are some, some folks that will just automatically machine translate a site and, you know, that's really not the best approach because here, here's what I, I want you to all keep in mind. Think of the effort that you put in to your English site, to your source site. And then by simply just doing a quick machine translation, you're essentially communicating to your clients that um, that's what they're worth is just sort of that quick machine translation. I would urge you to come up with a, um, a little bit better approach. And if budget's a concern, perhaps scale back what you're looking at. Maybe do a pilot project with your strongest country. That might be the best way to do it. There are ways to do machine translation. You can do some post editing. So it's just something you have to work out with your language service provider. There are many levels of service. Uh, you know, if you're a med medical device manufacturer, you might be looking for ISO 13 485 uh, level service where it's translated, edited, proof proofread. But if it's something that's less dangerous and uh, there's less risk, because translation is essentially all about risk. Um, you can look at lesser levels of service and that's something you can work out with your language service provider. But again, getting back to the SEO, you have to have good content. So think of it, uh, we, you try to create content that draws visitors in either through organic SEO or uh, through referral on your social networks. It has to be good content and the same is true in your international markets. And you'll wanna optimize those keywords and the way that those are done. So a good, a good translation provider is going to take a look at your keyword list and essentially use the most popular search engines um, and do searches to see what are the biggest hits. So, because you can translate words in many ways, but a good translator will make sure they're using the translations that generate the most hits on the search engines to get more traffic into your site. And it's very important in translation to also take care of the off-page materials or the metadata. So that would be, you know, the alt tags on images, the descriptions on images, the descriptions on pages. Those should all be translated and translated with SEO in mind. Um, Rob had talked a little bit about country code and top-level domains. That's also going to be very important for SEO and how you're attracting uh, visitors uh, to your site. Uh, Rob, anything to add on SEO and uh, uh, international sites? Just that the, the, the hidden things we don't see, right, that the metadata, those are the things that are often missed. Um, it's just the importance of that is, is we, don't, we never know what exactly, you know, these search engines are picking up. You know, years ago, they picked up all this different metadata, and then years later, they expunged them. They only based it off of header tags or title tags or actual physical content. So keeping everything, you know, in compliance with, uh, you know, your, especially your metadata that's behind the scenes uh, only just helps you continue to have, you know, an SEO value and worth not knowing what, you know, the, uh, the search engine gods you're going to, you know, force us to do next. Uh, but just always being on top of it and, and understanding that not only your content needs to be uh, translated properly, but also all those hidden items, your alt tags, as well as accessibility. So um, a lot of uh, SEO 
is actually getting involved in making sure your website is accessible um, and making sure it works with screen readers and such. So um, that's it's something just very much to consider in dealing with, with international business. Great, thank you, Rob. Another question came in for you. Um, it says, uh, and I'm assuming you mean for AE, do they do the uh, architectural blueprint and help companies when they're not looking for AE to host, but they need help in getting um, um, architectural setup? I guess, I, yep. I think she's using the word arch, but I think she means architectural setup. Yes, yeah, so um, it's, it's a huge strength, and we had a huge transformation of business probably five to, 10, five to eight years ago on the strategic side of business where uh, we will meet with you trying at the blueprint, the whole architectural structure of goals, uh, customer journeys, voice of customer, and understanding what you need for your website to be without actually physically even doing any development work. So understanding everything about the architectural sense of your website and, and giving you an idea of time, timeline, budget, um, before you even begin down the road of actually doing a site development and then even going towards phased approaches. So that is a service offering that uh, we strongly recommend to a lot of companies who say, we need to do something. We don't really know what we need to do. Can we sit with you, go through a discovery process, understand what we need to do. Um, and uh, it's absolutely a, a, a strong experience service that we offer. Great. Thanks, Rob. So um, it sounds like, uh, definitely people can pick and choose in terms of the services that they uh, will select from American Eagle, in other words. Correct. Okay, great. So Rob, I'm going to pass it off to you. If you could talk a little bit about how search or on-site search um, plays a role in translated websites. Sure. We all know, uh, you know, search is just one of those things these days that uh, we have, uh, uh, lower attention spans, or customers have lower attention spans. They want to go straight on to uh, your application and search for what they, they want, and they want that result immediately. But your search is only as good as the information you're feeding it. Um, it's also only as good as the, uh, the search technology of either your content management system or your actual website is using behind the scenes, allowing those results to, to show up for you. So um, a lot of bullets here, like what does your CMS allow? You know, is it a, is it a Lucene based search that's only searching certain fields in your content management system? Or is that uh, exact matches? Is it doing a prefix based on the first two or three letters of a search term uh, or a keyword or a content? And then how is it serving the content within a localized website? For example, if it's, uh, if your website's in 20 different versions and 20 different languages. So uh, content management systems allow us to separate content and allow specific information to be indexed and go into uh, and be searched upon and serve the results you want. Uh, and I'm on a, a, a plug here. There's many different search systems out there, but one is, one is called Hawk Search, and it's a third-party system, but it, it sits uh, behind the scenes, and your CMS actually, we can create the CMS to actually export uh, securely a file of information, uh, meaning you know, your title, your content fields, categories, the language, and it can go to the search engine and be processed in a certain way, which then have other rules around that content including in the sense of international content, how is that word being typed? Was there an umlaut above a vowel? And is it only reading that umlaut above that vowel with it um, for an exact match? Or is it actually normalizing that umlaut above a vowel to the letter A? Um, and, and actually matching that up to a search term or keyword that actually has the umlaut, but recognizing that it's the same word, but allowing that result to come through. So there are many search systems out there that do not allow this. Um, Hot search, in fact, does allow it, but you're also able to place many rules and, and boost certain results, boost certain sections or certain product lines of certain content, um, and also bury certain items that maybe aren't important for a result to pop up such high in your results. So, um, 
you do want to create the, the content that resonates and and just don't stop ever refining how um, how you're feeding that content to your search and and refining the rules around how you want that content to be found. Thanks, Robin. If I could add um, just a, a couple of quick points, and you know, definitely, you know, talk to your uh, translation provider and your web developer to make sure that all of the support systems that you expect, especially if you have a very active blog. So a lot of companies draw traffic to their site through informative blog posts, um, things that get picked up. Uh, and you should, of course, translate those to, again, hopefully extend your audience abroad. But make sure that the things that make blogs easy to use, the taxonomy, so in other words, the tags, the categories, the keywords, make sure all of those items are being properly translated because again, that's going to help your user navigate your site. You know, the search bubble is certainly very important, but you also want to give them the architecture to go through your site and find other interesting posts or articles that are relevant to um, what they're trying to discover about your company on the site. And, you know, definitely, um, I think the days of quote unquote brochureware are over. I mean, you want to make sure you don't do that for your international sites either. Try to be as dynamic as possible. Try to create new content, um, new items that are going to resonate with your users no matter where they are in the world. Um, so let's move forward. Again, please feel free to ask some questions. We've had some good ones so far. Uh, please feel free to uh, jump on chat and ask any questions. Um, if you have something uh, that you'd like us to, to cover for you. Um, a little bit about targeting. Of course, the reason we do this, we want to generate more leads, right? So you, you create that international presence so you can generate more business across the globe. So again, some of the same considerations that, you, uh, that go into the creation of the content for your source site uh, will apply to your translated versions as well. Who comes to your site? You know, know understand a profile. Um, you know, is it, you know, what type of users are coming? What type of content should we be creating? And also you should think of it from an aspirational sense. Like who do you want to come to your site? Who, what types of content should we generate? And again, it may differ by country. You may want to create specific types of content to attract um, you know, the engineers to your site to look at the specs for your product, you know, that sort of thing. Obviously, it'll vary if you have e-commerce or other types of uh, uh, applications that you're doing on the web. And look at your markets. I think, you know, Rob had alluded to it a little bit earlier. Um, use Google Analytics, talk to your web developer and, and help them analyze what's in the analytics to understand. So if you have that question, well, gee, I, I, I only have budget to do one version of Spanish. Um, what should I focus on? Well, if all of your traffic comes from Mexico, you may actually want to do a, a specifically a version that's Spanish for Mexico. If all your traffic's coming from Spain, instead of doing something, um, you know, for Mexico, you do Spanish for Spain. Or if you're getting traffic from a lot of different Spanish speaking regions, you can do something a little more neutral by working with your language service provider and choosing, um, you know, there really is no such thing as neutral Spanish. But again, if you only have one one uh, you know, budget for one version, you could perhaps choose Latin American Spanish, which will be a little more applicable. Um, so uh, use that content to determine how you're going to target those leads and how you're going to get people onto the site. Rob, anything to add to this topic? Now you touched on the analytical side and uh, you know, data is king and, and knowing where your customers come from and how you can serve them better is always going to be you know, the number one goal of any business. Um, but it doesn't end once you put a new site live either. So keep analyzing where your traffic's coming from and how you can actually serve and, 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 and gain more business in certain regions. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, this is a big topic, uh, but it's one that we certainly have to address as best we can um, in the limited time we have. Uh, as many of you know, there are as many CMS, I, I like to say, as there are stars in the sky. <laughs> so there's really, really a wide variety of choices. Rob, if you could walk us through a little bit of that conversation that you have with the client when they say, gosh, I, I don't know if I'm a WordPress person or a Sitecore. I really don't know what I need. How do you, how do you, how do you guys help people make that decision? Yeah, we, we really try to go into every, every uh, project, kind of starting a project, CMS agnostic, um, 
unless unless a customer comes in with a specific CMS already in mind that they they've already purchased or want to use. But you know, choosing the right CMS is is just a huge hot topic. Um, you know, on every individual and team, you know, looking to a to a new web development project, and it's it's such not an easy decision uh, to make. You know, so many factors, so many questions have to be answered. Um, and, you know, in my case, you know, a recommendation for a specific content management system is really hard, hard to make just based on knowing minimal facts. So the bullets you see on your screen just scratch the surface of, of capabilities of a content management system. And, um, but, you know, when we get into requirements, you know, will an open source CMS like WordPress satisfy your requirements? It might, possibly. Um, but scenario, what if you are running a single page application with 25 different versions and translated in 12 different languages? Um, you know, that's a, it's a more difficult situation there and it's something we have to, to weigh and, and lead you uh, in the right direction. And, you know, my role here, you know, along with our, our strategy department, just like the question was asked about, can you help architect and help suggest, uh, you know, a CMS for our project? you know, is to ask these questions. We want to discover, you know, what your company needs are uh, digitally and then make the best recommendation based on your budget, based on your goals and requirements of the digital project that you want to, you want to produce. So can I recommend here and right now, which CMS is the best? I, I can't. Um, but each CMS, you know, does have its strengths and its weaknesses, which is why developers here, especially AmericanEagle.com, we work with, uh, you know, many many different CMS partners. Um, and we've vetted these over the years. Really, we've really tried to, to work directly and have direct lines to a lot of CMS different partners to, to guide you in the right direction and then execute on your vision for success. Um, so that's, I, I could go on and on about CMSs. I've worked with many, I've uh, represented many teams, um, but, uh, you know, ultimately it comes down to what is right for you. Great. Uh, and if I could jump in and add one thing, um, if you could, um, you know, I, what I would, would suggest is bring your language service provider into that conversation at some point. Um, you know, the, the folks that your developer should, of course, understand. If you are going to translate the site, please make that one of your requirements. Um, that you're talking to the developers about when they're helping you choose the CMS, because that's another thing that has certainly happened with customer of our, customers of ours historically, is that um, there are times when they've said, you know, gosh, I'm a little frustrated because we created the we created this site pretty much as a single language site, and at the very last minute, you know, after development we were told that it was going to be translated. So we didn't make accommodations for that. So that's really an important thing. You know, make sure that even if it's not on your roadmap in the next 12 months, but if you're gonna keep that site for a little while and translation is on the radar, please at least bring it up to the developer. And um, all CMS are not created equal in terms of how they interact with translation management systems. So uh, TMS is what we use to handle content of all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, and there are some content management systems that very seamlessly connect to translation management systems. So in other words, you as the user can publish a page and say, hey, I'd like this in three languages. Click, it goes to the provider, they translate it, push it back, minimal file handling, it's, you know, it's a beautiful thing. So that's sort of the nirvana level of a CMS in translation. Uh, what's not is when you don't even have an ability to export content out of the site for um, you know, gathering a scope for translation. And that's something um, that happens a lot. You know, we'll get a client that says, hey, can you just, you know, scrape the site and see what the cost is? Well, you know, that's not really the best way to do it. Um, if, you, if you do that and you give that to five different providers and say, hey, go scrape the site and give me a quote, you could get 200% variance on the quotes. Um, you're much better off uh, choosing a CMS that will allow you to export into either XLIF, uh, which is an XML standard for translation, or XML, or HTML, but definitely work with your developer to uh, make sure that you're covering how the content is going to come in and out of the site. Uh, we do have a, late, uh, uh, a question, Rob, and the question is, does not supporting many languages make your website development slower? 
is there an optimum number of supported languages versus good development in terms of time and profits? It's a really good question. Um, it really comes down to what markets you want um, to be in. Uh, it can it can actually slow down if you're you know depending on how you're obtaining those translations. If you're working with a company like Argo, they'll know their timelines. Uh, but if you're working with uh, localized uh, company translators, uh, it may slow down. Those people have other jobs to do. Um, they you know translations aren't their priority. So it, it could uh, slow down development time as far as obtaining those. But if you're using the, you know, the right CMS, um, the right methods of uh, what Peter said, in and out, and uh, using certain, what Peter's going to cover in a few minutes, called workflow um, of checking those translations, uh, it, it, you know, your risk is minimized. So um, being, knowing what you need and in your timeline when you need it and providing the the outbound communication to obtain those in a timely fashion and also checking, uh, you know, it's all time, uh, time consumable resources to, to do it, but um, we'll slow down the actual development process, possibly, but if it's prepared and uh, planned for properly, uh, you should be able to stay on track. Great. Um, that, was, that was indeed a really good question. And, um, Rob brought up a really good point. You know, we do have clients that will do translation internally and, you know, that's fine. That's certainly a very guerrilla way of approaching the translation um, uh, issue. You know, it's it, it, obviously, ah, I'm using internal resources. That doesn't cost me anything. But here, here's what I'd like to challenge uh, you to think about is that if that happens, um, you're taking that person off the line. Like Rob said, so now you have a salesperson who's supposed to be selling and now they're translating. And a good translator can do about 2,500 words a day. Someone who's not a professional may only do 1,000 words per day. And, you know, how strong of a job are they going to do? And do they understand markup? So if they're looking, you know, they're not going to be able to necessarily translate an XML and code like a language service provider would. Plus, the idea of translation memory is sort of out the window because this is really an important point. If you work with a language service provider that uses translation memory tools, they're going to database all the translations. So if two years from now you say, our content is good, but you talk to Rob and his team and you say, but we want to reskin our site. Well, if you're just retheming or changing the formatting on the site, but the content stays essentially the same, that translation management provider the translation provider should be able to use their database and the translation costs should be minimal. That's an incredibly important uh, point. So, um, okay, uh, great. So let's go ahead and roll forward into building a translation process. So, um, you know, the process can take many forms. What I'm showing you here is very much a standard format. Um, so uh, one of the most important things is parsing um, the content. And usually we do a little bit of a test with that. So we'll work with the web developer and come up with a way to get sort of a test, uh, to get a, a test um, extraction. And we'll either put, um, you know, Latin in there or some sort of test content and send it back, all caps, we can do all caps as well, send it back to the client. So you can quickly see, are we capturing all the content? Uh, oftentimes in a CMS, you'll have custom fields or custom content that you're not able um, to grab unless you make special accommodations. That type of testing will flush that issue out uh, pretty quickly. So we call that part of that round trip test. Then of course we launch into translation, editing. If there's a client review step, in other words, let's say that salesperson that we were talking about, instead of having them translate, but you want them to weigh in, you could have them review. That would be a much faster activity. And your translation service provider can help you with managing that process. Then the content should be imported to the site. You do a functional review, and this is very important. You should have an editor, a translation editor, review the site, whether it's in a sandbox or in a staging environment. That way they'll look if anything broke. Here's some things to think about. German is a great example. They have compound nouns. They have some words that are just incredibly long. So you'll want to make sure, what is that doing? You know, is there a compound noun that screws up a title or a caption? 
know, those are the things that will come out of functional review. It's essentially a user test. They're acting like a user on the site or the application. Um, you know, that would, that would apply to translating mobile apps and applications as well. At that point, they'll implement markups and then finally the site is published. So, um, you know, that's really a, uh, a, good, um, a good workflow. Uh, again, there could be other steps, there could be additional accommodations that are made. Um, really, it's a, a project by, on a project by project basis. Uh, Rob, any questions that, or any uh, points that you might add here? Yes, just like you said, it's it's a project by project, and you know Peter with Argo has has that experience as well as is catering to what your needs are, and translations and catering to you to your you know workflow needs to to customize the flow that you need to best effectively execute on your translation project. On the web development side as well, um, our project managers that run projects for you. You know, also collaborate with your translation partner uh, to then also have that workflow properly set and communicating directly um, always to make sure that timelines are, are always in mind and that transfer process of your languages, if it is through an import or um, some type of mechanism getting into the website and then checked upon are reviewed properly. So workflow is huge. Uh, it's just one of those things where, you know, the more you know, the more you're educated on the process and understand it. We want it to be a simple process for the client. We don't want this to be a frustrating process and, and unknowingly or surprises um, and being upfront and understanding that workflow um, of a project is key to, to your success. Absolutely, great point, Rob. Yes, because as we all know, creating a website is a bit of a creative process, and that's really essentially, you know, what we're trying to do is to help you avoid rework, to help you understand ramifications of changes, um, you know, when the project's on a critical path, and you know, just really understanding um, how to do this in the most optimal way, and that's that's really really important. And it's also important to cover with your developer and your translation service provider how are updates going to be handled, and what does that workflow look like. Um, you know, those are all really, really important points. Um, we certainly want to be respectful of people's time. We're approaching about 51 minutes into the webinar. Uh, we have covered um, all the topics we intended to cover. Uh, we did get an influx of questions. We're not going to be able to cover them all in, in, in the webinar, uh, but we promise you that we will reach out to you all individually for those of you that had additional questions. Um, from, um, from me at Argo and all the people at Argo, thank you for attending. Rob, thank you so much for uh, joining the webinar and providing a lot of insight uh, to our joint customers. Uh, any closing thoughts from you, Rob? No, I mean, uh, you know, Peter runs a great translation business and it's, uh, you know, we're happy to be uh, wonderful partners with him and the services he provides to his customers. So we want, uh, like I said earlier, I, I love to have fun teaching and explaining how how things work in this digital world and as, along with a lot of my fellow coworkers in, in strategy and across AmericanEagle.com. So if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to reach out to me. I, I can, I'll either answer directly or I'll connect you with somebody that uh, can answer your questions for you. Um, and we look forward to, to speaking with you soon. Thank you very much, Rob. We feel the same way at Argo. I think the important point, um, you know, our friends at American Eagle, uh, it's always nice when we have a relationship with the developer. It really helps things um, move more smoothly through the process. And that's something that we can't stress enough. Uh, it's really good that your translation provider and the developer have a relationship and are able to work well uh, with your team. So thank you very much for joining all of us. We will indeed um, we will indeed send the recording out soon. Uh, thank you very much. And if we didn't get to your questions, we will definitely uh, reach out individually. Thank you very much.